George McGovern, former senator, now chairman of Americans for Common Sense. Today, Secretary of State Schultz stated during a press conference at the close of the meetings between President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev that both leaders were disappointed at the outcome of discussions regarding the Strategic Defense Initiative. But he also indicated that they had made tremendous progress towards what he called potential agreements on a wide, wide range of issues centering on arms control. Do you think that this interim summit was worthwhile? Well, it's a little difficult really to know for sure. We haven't seen the text of anything that was discussed at that agreement. I would have to tell you, based on what I heard and saw on television and the brave effort of Mr. Schulf to put, put the uh, best possible light on it, which is understandable, uh, that it was probably a minor uh, public relations triumph and a substantive flop. I don't see where they accomplished anything. I hope I can revise that tomorrow uh, when we look at the text and get a little more information on it. I notice one of the networks is referring to their report on it as the collapsed summit. I don't think it got quite to the summit, but I agree with the temporary diagnos diagnosis that it was a collapse. I don't think much happened. Congressman James Corder, a Republican of New Jersey. Do you see it as a collapsed summit? or a substantive flop, as Senator McGovern has said? No, I don't think so. I was uh, apprehensive about uh, the, this mini-summit or preparatory summit in the very beginning. Uh, I always thought that the summit should be well-organized, uh, orchestrated events with uh, due preparation. This one came upon us very, very quickly. I also felt that uh, the timing before the elections uh, was particularly of a concern to me, and particularly the president saying he, in fact, was not going to meet before the elections. Um, I was also concerned about uh, the atmospherics that was going around before the Daniloff case. And it seemed to me that uh, there would be a great deal of pressure upon Ronald Reagan to cave in to Soviet demands because uh, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, could have made the statement that he showed his goodwill by releasing uh, Mick, uh, Nicholas Daniloff and that Ronald Reagan would have to show uh, a likewise a gesture of good faith by compromising in an area that he didn't think was in the best long-term security interests of the United States. So I think the president made a, a valiant effort here. Uh, nothing, obviously, of great substance was achieved. Um, and I think we're going to have to uh, basically wait to find out what the president says this coming uh, Wednesday or when he gets back to the United States as to where we go from here. I would hope uh, that he uh, moves toward uh, a decision with regard to deploying strategic defense. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us and our viewers who watched uh, Secretary of State Schultz's uh, full press conference this afternoon, he did uh, talk about a, a proposal offered by the Soviet Union regarding SDI and strategic missiles and then a uh, counterproposal, I suppose you could call it, by President Reagan on, uh, on the same issue. How significant is this give and take on, on the issue of SDI right now? I think the uh, bottom line is that uh, President Reagan, for all his good intentions, prefers Star Wars to an arms control agreement. Now you can argue about whether that's right or wrong, but it seemed to me what came across in the Secretary's very carefully chosen words is that they had an opportunity to negotiate uh, substantial cutbacks in strategic weapons, maybe their elimination over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. They had a chance to eliminate intermediate range uh, nuclear weapons, both on the Soviet side and the American European uh, side. Those things he talked about as extremely important potential uh, gains. But then as he got to the end of his uh, report, he said, I'm disappointed in the end to tell you that in a sense all of this fell through when we would not agree to delay Star Wars, to delay the uh, so-called strategic defense initiative. So what it all boils down to, and thus I've misread these preliminary reports, is that the administration would rather proceed with the uh, research, the uh, development, the testing, and the possible deployment of the uh, so-called Star Wars uh, system, they'd rather have that than they would this opportunity to end the arms race to reduce the presence of strategic and uh, intermediate range missiles. And I suppose what the uh, citizen has to judge is whether he or she would rather see an end to the arms race and substantial reductions in these missiles that threaten our survival and that are now threatening our economy, or whether we'd con rather continue with uh, this tremendously expensive and I think destabilizing new weapons system called Strategic Defense Initiative.
Congressman Corder, do you agree that that's the choice? No, I don't. I obviously disagree with the senator quite substantially. Uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, it seems to me that it's rather unique that we have the first opportunity in the history to end the arms race, number one. It seems to me that uh, if that could have been achieved, it would have been achieved uh, during prior presidents, uh, that during the time when uh, strategic weapons on the Soviet side and uh, uh, were significantly less than ours. Um, also, uh, we have entered into strategic arms agreements before SALT I, the ABM Treaty, SALT II. SALT I and SALT II basically permitted the massive increase uh, of strategic nuclear weapons uh, by both sides, and particularly the Soviet Union has taken advantage of it. Um, I, I also disagree that this was uh, an opportunity uh, to make uh, massive cuts in, in offensive weapons. Uh, maybe we would have and could have achieved uh, a reduction of uh, 30 percent, let's say, in uh, strategic reentry vehicles by the Soviet Union, but at too great a cost. And the cost is giving up Americans' right to defend ourselves and our people and our population and help defend our allies in, in Western Europe and the Middle East, particularly Israel. It seems to me that the Soviets, uh, by their insisting that they, that Ronald Reagan uh, forego uh, the right to Americans defend ourselves, uh, means that they just want one SDI, and that's theirs. Uh, because all the evidence is that the Soviets are moving in this direction toward deploying strategic defense as quickly as they can. It's important to keep in mind that the Soviets are the only power in the world that have a deployed strategic defense. Now, granted, it's in, uh, in one location, it's around Moscow, and it's limited, limited at the present time to 100 launch launchers, but it's being dramatically modernized. We have no such system, and uh, I think uh, the president made the right choice. I think he uh, walked the extra while, uh, the mile. It's, it's not a situation where we can gloat over, but I would imagine that the Soviets will indeed be back. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just say in response mm -hmm. that you, you chose well in picking the congressman and, and yes, me to, to be on tonight because obviously we have a different view of the uh, value to the United States of the so-called strategic mm -hmm. defense initiative. If I thought for one minute that it would add anything mm -hmm. to the defense of the United States, uh, I wouldn't be speaking against it. No one would. Everybody's in favor of uh, defending America. You don't have to be... Uh, very bright to be interested in the security and well-being of, of this country. The question is how best to do that. Uh, do you do it by uh, launching a new round of increases in the arms race, which I think is the net result of proceeding on the Star Wars system? The congressman may very well be right that the Soviets are either moving in this direction or soon will be. But that's the purpose of an arms control conference, to try to get an agreement on certain things that prevent this arms race from escalating out of control. And as I understand what the uh, Soviets were uh, proposing, they were saying if, uh, if we can get an agreement even to delay for a period of time, I think the uh, term was 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, anything other than research, as I understand it, they were willing to permit research on uh, these defensive uh, systems. Uh, then in return for that, they'd be willing to enter in with the United States to mu mutual reductions on both sides of the uh, strategic weapons systems. I don't, uh, I'm not under the illusion that they do that uh, because they're Sunday school boys. I think they're hard bitten tough-minded uh, realists uh, who recognize that there's nothing to be gained for them in continuing this uh, arms race. And I don't think there's anything to be gained in it for us. Again, I'd concede to the uh, congressman that we're not going to stop the arms race dead in its tracks. But here was an opportunity to make a long step uh, in that direction. And um, I think, uh, based on our preliminary reports, we missed that opportunity. Congressman, uh, we'll let you uh, okay. go ahead with the response, and then I'll introduce you. OK, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, two responses. First of all, it wasn't very big of the Soviet Union to permit us in their, their proposal, if, if it was a proposal, uh, to continue basic research in strategic defense. Uh, we have that right now. Uh, we, we, are, we have that right under the existing ABM treaty. So they're giving us that right is giving us nothing at all. It's giving us what we now have. Uh, so I don't think that's a particularly wonderful thing that they've done. Um, what, uh, what if, if you don't proceed with uh, deployment of strategic defense, moving towards testing and deployment, basically what we're doing is re-ratifying and recodifying the existent 
the existing uh, doctrine of mutually assured destruction. And that's based on uh, the, the concept that uh, both of us have offensive weapons and offensive weapons of increased accuracy and uh, from the Soviet standpoint, more offensive weapons, uh, offensive weapons with greater payload and offensive weapons with uh, massively higher megatonnage and yield than the United States. And therefore the threat of mutual retaliation, revenge, uh, basically is a doctrine that keeps us out of war. Uh, I think it's a foolish doctrine. I think it's something we should move away from. Uh, I think it doesn't necessarily bring us stability, uh, but less stability. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, relies on some critical assumptions that may not always take place. Uh, the fact that mistakes will not happen, that you won't have a, a nuclear Chernobyl, uh, the launch by an irate Soviet commander of some missiles. Um, if that occurs uh, and you don't have deployed defenses, uh, you have no option. Uh, the President of the United States has to simply watch uh, a significant percentage of the population incinerated or launch a retaliatory attack against the other side. I think we can do better than that. Good evening. As you know, the preliminary summit in Iceland <coughs> has come to an end today. And while the full account, the news account of uh, the event and full analysis is not yet in, we are going to be taking this opportunity for the next hour and a half to open up the phones and talk to you about some of the possible outcomes and consequences of this meeting between President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev. And we'll talk about some of the issues leading up to the summit and also points of discussions which, which have already come up, the SDI as well, human rights and nuclear weapons testing and a lot more that uh, may be on your mind. We are pleased to have with us George McGovern, who, as you know, of course, is a former senator from North Dakota. He South is Dakota. So South Dakota, <laughs> extremely. Excuse me. He is currently the chairman of Americans for Common Sense. Senator, what, what is that organization? Well, I have to be uh, candid about this. When I became a candidate for the presidency in 1984, Americans for Common Sense, which was a nonpartisan tax exempt organization, had to be disbanded. We couldn't, I couldn't be a candidate for partisan office and at the same time operate that committee. What it attempted to do uh, for several years was to provide an answer to the extreme radical right-wing attacks that had been partially responsible for the defeat of a good many senators in 1980. I was one of the victims, so I had a special interest in finding an answer to that. Mm -hmm. Also with us this evening is Congressman Jim Corder, a Republican of New Jersey, who has been in Congress since 1978 and is a member of the Armed Services Committee and also sits on the subcommittees of Procurement and Military Nuclear Systems and Research and Development. Welcome to you both. Phone numbers are on your screen. Uh, we invite you to go ahead and pick up the phone and start dialing those numbers. We will be discussing some of these issues for about another 15 minutes or so, and then we'll be taking your calls for a full hour. So do go ahead and, and dial the phone, and when you get that ringing sound, it means you are in line, and just keep letting it ring, and meanwhile, keep your sound turned up and, uh, and listen to us. Uh, gentlemen, let's start out by talking about the reasons for this summit and how we got there. Uh, why did President Reagan agree to a pre-summit at this stage? And we were talking a little bit about it before. Congressman, you want to start out? Um, I don't really know. I was concerned about uh, the possibilities of uh, a great deal of pressure on Ronald Reagan um, at this uh, mini-summit. Uh, I think he wanted to have it to keep the momentum going with regard to dialogue. Uh, he might have felt that if you had this type of organizational meeting, the summit then later on in the United States uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be a better organized one with more substantive things being accomplished. I know that the president uh, does not hesitate to bring up important issues such as bilateral concerns between <coughs> the Soviet Union and the United States, wheat, for example, and the Soviets not fulfilling that contractual obligation. Uh, human rights, I know he likes to pressure and press the Soviet Union for a change in their uh, basic human rights policy, particularly with regard to its own citizens, and saw this as an opportunity to do that. Uh, those are some of the things, and I think he just in wanted to indicate to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev that he was willing to sit down. Uh, that he was willing to discuss things, and I think the president should be, uh, should be praised for that. But I thought uh, coming so quickly on the heels of the Daniloff affair, uh, he probably should have uh, waited until after the elections. Senator, did you see any uh, significance with the Daniloff affair as well, with the, with the timing of the summit? Not really. I'm, I'm inclined to um, agree with the congressman on this point. We disagree sharply on the advantage of the Star Wars system, but uh, uh, like uh, the congressman, I was somewhat puzzled as to why the uh, president 
would go to an important conference of this kind with what seemed like such scanty preparation. Uh, one day we have the uh, president indicating there won't be any uh, summit conference until after the election. No, uh, as a matter of fact, he said he wouldn't uh, release the Soviet uh, spy uh, in exchange for an American uh, journalist and then turned around and did it, uh, which raised some serious uh, questions, I think. Uh, but I suppose the uh, pressure that was coming in from the country and from the Congress from, and from other sources indicating that an overwhelming majority of the people want to see some progress in bringing this arms race under control may have led the president to think that it's ill-advised to go into an election less than a month from now without some indication on his part that he's willing to talk about an arms control agreement. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know the full consequences of, of uh, the discussion here and the, uh, the outcome of, uh, of this mini-summit. But given the uh, disagreement over between the two leaders over SDI, do you think that it might mean an end to the possibility of actually forging an agreement on arms control in general for President Reagan? I, I, would, say, uh, I would say that it probably does. Um, Obviously, uh, no American has access to what's going on inside the uh, Kremlin, but it's my own strong hunch that what Gorbachev was trying to do was to find out whether there was any change in the president's position on Star Wars. That's the one thing on which I think the Soviets won't compromise. They're not going to agree to substantial reductions in their offensive system if we proceed with a defensive system that may nullify their capacity to uh, respond in a nuclear exchange. As a matter of fact, what I think will now happen if we begin to move towards the development and deployment of SDI, I have no doubt the Soviets will escalate their strategic system. I think we'll end up with more missiles targeted on the United States, we'll be less secure and that Star Wars, after an expenditure of what is estimated at a trillion dollars, will leave us less secure than we are today. Beyond that, it's going to uh, uh, obviously add to the cost of the arms race on both sides. I think that's a basic reason why the Soviets want to stop it. As I say, it's not necessary for altruistic reasons, but they're feeling the pains of bankruptcy from the kind of arms pressure uh, they're under. But I can't imagine uh, Mr. Gorbachev being anxious to come here next year for another summit, having tested the waters and discovered that there's no give and take on this question of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Well, he, uh, it, it's not that there's no give and take on the question of Star Wars. I think the president made his position quite clear, although he wanted to do it privately with the first secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev, by sending the letter saying, I think wrongly that he was willing to defer deployment for seven and a half years. I think that would have been a mistake because it would have once again perpetuated uh, the system and the situation, the strategic situation that we have today. Offensive weapons and the proliferation of offensive weapons by both sides. Um, also, uh, the Soviet Union at the present time has a redundancy in offensive weapons. Uh, there's no real incentive. In other words, we're not exactly uh, uh, secure uh, in our knowledge that the Soviets can't uh, first strike the United States, that uh, we, can, we can protect ourselves because we can't. Um, everybody recognizes that our land-based leg of our deterrent is now almost totally vulnerable. Uh, we have a, uh, but for the B-1 bomber, we have uh, significant problems in penetrating a Soviet airspace. Um, and thirdly, although uh, we have relied on our submarines uh, with uh, the fact that uh, some people have uh, given our secrets up, uh, and also as, as we continue to modernize our submarines, we have less of them, um, there's a question as to whether that's going to be a significant deterrent against the Soviet Union. So simply we have to do something. The status quo is not good. Now, we're not in the best strategic situation we've ever been in. As a matter of fact, we're in the most vulnerable one. And to suggest that it's somehow uh, dangerous to defend yourself, I, I don't understand that. And I know uh, I respect very much the senator, but those people that are against it attempt very frankly, and I guess it's a good debating point, to belittle uh, the concept of strategic defense by calling it Star Wars. It has nothing to do with war. It has something to do with peace. It's a shield. And, and mostly, most of the research is going toward non-nuclear defensive capabilities. Uh, so I think that's an appropriate thing to do. And uh, for, for us to say that we're not going to conform or cave in to the Soviet demand for 10 years 
in, in deploying a, a, a non-nuclear defensive shield around this country. Uh, you th to criticize that, I think you can. I think you have to praise that. And because it's the responsibility of the, pre of the President of the United States to, number one, deter war and to protect our citizens, and that's simply what he's attempting to do. I think the President, let me just end with mm -hmm. this, the President recognizes that there are arms control agreements that are good and arms control agreements that are bad, and that entering into a bad agreement is worse, very frankly, than entering into none at all. Well, on that point, uh, let me just say that President Reagan has yet to find an arms control agreement he thought was good. He didn't agree with the limited nuclear test ban that President Kennedy put through in 1963, which stopped the uh, testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, a treaty that passed overwhelmingly with the ratification of Republicans and Democrats alike. He didn't like the SALT I treaty negotiated by President Nixon. He didn't like the SALT II treaty negotiated by President Ford and by uh, President Carter. I've yet to find an arms control agreement this president likes well, or a weapon he, that he doesn't well, like. I, I think that's, that, that's unfair, very I don't frankly, think it's unfair. I, I think it's very unfair, Senator. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's important to notice that we have just entered into an agreement with regard to troop levels with the Soviet Union. It's an arms control agreement, and it's one of the president's initiatives. It's important to keep in mind that SALT I and SALT II permitted uh, the escalation of Soviet offensive capabilities from approximately 2,500 warheads to the 10 or 11,000 that they have today. That's not a remarkable achievement. I think that's it, not an achievement at all. Congressman, I you, think what the president wants to do is, is to move toward the significant scaling back and reduction of offensive weapons. And for those offensive weapons that the Soviet Union chooses to maintain, build defenses to deter their ever being used. I think that's reasonable. It's appropriate. It's, it's very consistent with the, with the history of this country. It's, uh, f as far as I'm concerned, it's similar to building walls uh, mm -hmm. against arrows. It, it, it's akin to putting a gas mask on if someone's going to threaten you with the poisonous gas. Congressman, you and, I, you and I have both been around the political scene a long time. You know you never get everything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen an arms control mm -hmm. agreement that was exactly the way I would like to have seen it come out. Obviously, we'd <laughs> like to see the United States do better in every agreement. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that over the last 25 years, we've been able to work out some agreements that at least so, so far have prevented the world from getting into a, a nuclear confrontation, uh, I, a I nuclear exchange. I and I, and, I, I, and I think uh, I would say this to you, that these arms control agreements, the uh, limited nuclear test ban, which stopped the uh, uh, polluting of the air with radioactive materials, the SALT I and SALT II agreements, they had the endorsement of all of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Mm -hmm. The reason they did is not that these military leaders were soft on the idea of defense, but because they saw that while they were limited steps forward, they did put some kind of ceiling on the, uh, on the arms race. I recognize what you say is true, mm -hmm. that under those treaties, uh, the Soviet Union increased to uh, their nuclear power, where would they have been in the absence of those treaties? The same, At least, they, the same place I, they are I don't today. agree with that. Same I, place they are today. I think that if we had gone ahead with the SALT II treaty, which mm -hmm. incidentally died not in the Kremlin, but I regret to say in the United States Senate, that would yeah. have required the Soviets was, uh, to dismantle the the some Soviets, 300 yeah. of their strategic uh, uh, nuclear systems. I but, think it was, as the Joint Chiefs said, in the interest of the defense mm -hmm. of the United States. That was, that was about the time the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, I think, was one of the reasons the Senate did not uh, ratify SALT II. Although, right, uh, although the Democratic-controlled uh, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, before the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, voted unanimously. Uh, against the ratification of, uh, of SALT II. I'm not uh, holding also, up the I Democratic mean, Armed no, Services no, Committee well, as a model of what oh, we ought to okay, do either. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that out. I thought you'd yeah. be interested in recalling Could that. Could I ask you as yeah, a... Let, let, in, in a minute, yes, you can. <laughs> but I think there is a significant uh, philosophical difference between the approach of the Senator and myself. And I think what he said, uh, obviously he, 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 he firmly believes it, and a lot of people do. Uh, he said that our agreements uh, have kept us uh, out of war with the Soviet Union. Uh, our agreements uh, have, uh, have kept uh, the world safe. Uh, number one, I would argue that the world is not safer now than it was 20 years ago. I would argue it's less safe because our deterrent is now vulnerable. 
and the Soviet Union offensive capability has massively increased. You think the agreements number, are responsible and, for and, that? And number two, um, I would say that is that it is in fact our deterrent and our strength that has deterred, not the agreements. And I think the senator, uh, marvelously articulate as he is, represents those groups in American society, and there's a number of them, uh, that believe that talking uh, is, is, uh, is going to achieve uh, total peace. Uh, talking is important. It can help. Uh, but it's our strength, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that has deterred the Soviet Union. The agreements are important, mm -hmm. particularly and most importantly, if they can uh, increase stability, if they, re if they can reduce uh, offensive nuclear weapons. Heretofore, mm -hmm. none of the agreements on nuclear weapons that we have signed have uh, deterred the Soviet Union from a massive offensive buildup. And as I suggested before, I think this president, with the idea of doing research, development, testing, and deploying non-nuclear defensive system, it systems is moving toward the the goal of the incentives of creating the incentives that the Soviet Union may have in reducing their offensive arsenal because those defensive systems will make less militarily useful uh, the offensive weapons and therefore more easily negotiated away let me, let me just comment on uh, mm -hmm. what has been said here uh, it's a little bit confusing to follow the congressman's line of reasoning here a few moments ago mm -hmm. he was saying that the doctrine of deterrence uh, is a mad and uh, an immoral doctrine. Now he's saying that it's deterrence that has kept the peace over the last uh, 40 years. That's because I, I want to make clear that uh, I'm not against the fact that we've used deterrence over the last 40 years to help uh, preserve the peace. And keep in mind that the arms control agreements that this country has entered into, including <coughs> anything that we'd be willing to enter into now, does not jeopardize the deterrent uh, capability of the United States. We've had the capacity for many years, we still do, to utterly pulverize the Soviet Union or any other potential adversary, even if they were to strike first. We've had a great deal of talk under the uh, Reagan administration and some here tonight about the vulnerability of land-based missiles. To whatever extent uh, land-based missiles are becoming vulnerable to attack, we need to keep in mind that 75% of the U.S. strategic missile system is not on the land. It's in submarines and on bombers and in cruise missiles. It's just the reverse in the Soviet Union. 75% of their strategic nuclear missile system is on the land. So that if land-based missiles are becoming vulnerable, it's the Soviet Union and not the United States well, that has the window of uh, vulnerability. Now, the this, truth this, is that neither the, side, the, the truth is that neither that's side that's uh, can be destroyed by the other without inviting a society destroying retaliation. And uh, I agree couple, that's uh, the basic reason why we haven't had uh, uh, nuclear okay. war. I'm glad you agree with that. We'll be taking calls in a couple and minutes, and I, and I think the, the arms control agreements have helped preserve and stabilize that deterrent balance between the two countries. All right, let me jump in and ask a, a question about uh, the congressional role in all of this. Mm -hmm. The arms control, there were a couple of arms control provisions added to the defense spending bill, which then became part of the continuing resolution. Referring to this process and the compromise that came out of it, Speaker O'Neill was quoted in the New York Times today as saying, we in the Congress can legislate arms control up to a point. We can use public statements in support of arms control up to a point, but we cannot sit at the bargaining table in Iceland. Congressman given that you're still in Congress. Uh, what, what is the role of Congress in, in, uh, in arms control discussions? Well, I, I think there's difference in differing roles between the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, obviously, we both deal with uh, authorization and appropriations bills, and, and therefore they do have an impact on the President's uh, capability of negotiating because you can't negotiate without having something to give away, and we would give him something to give away. So, in essence, uh, both houses have that very important function and role. We also have the role of informing uh, the public uh, as to what is going to happen. Uh, I'm a member of the, uh, uh, the, the group that's monitoring the agreements in Geneva, and I think it's important for members of the House and Senate to do that and, for, and to inform their constituents. In addition, the Senate, of course, is uh, charged with the constitutional responsibility of ratifying uh, arms control agreements, and I might point out that they have not ratified uh, uh, SALT II. However, I believe uh, that uh, when uh, the House of Representatives in particular 
uh, forces the president's hand uh, by linking their votes uh, with the president's position on arms control, saying the president must take this position. If he doesn't, uh, we're going to not fund uh, essential and critical weapon systems. And then it places uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, and, and I think perhaps maybe the senator would not agree, in the enviable position of choosing who to negotiate with, uh, the House of Representatives or the President of the United States. And I think uh, our founding fathers were correct. It's the president who's supposed to negotiate arms control agreements and deal with foreign policy. And the House of Representatives is least suited of the Senate and the, and the president to do that. Uh, we have our pulse uh, very, very close to the American people. We're here only a couple of years. We face re-election almost all the time, at least it feels like it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the Senate and the president that has uh, a longer term in office is better suited for that purpose. And, and therefore, I believe that the House's position with regard to those arms control positions that you point out significantly weakened the president's hands. And, and, and uh, the Speaker of the House, when he basically said, uh, since it's on the eve of this uh, pre-summit summit, uh, we, sh we should not force uh, the issue any further, I think was a statesman in that regard. Uh, looking at, and, and very quickly, uh, these particular positions of the House of Representatives, it's important to keep in mind uh, that they wanted to prevent us from testing an anti-satellite system. Uh, all the while, the Soviets have the only operational system in the world. And granted, it's not the most sophisticated, but indeed it works. Uh, so they wanted us not to have that capability, all the while the Soviets have that capability. They wanted us not to uh, uh, manufacture um, binary uh, chemical weapons and at the same time reducing the stockpile of chemical weapons in the United States, all the while the Soviet Union, to our best knowledge, is increasing their stock of chemical weapons. And uh, the various uh, proposals uh, that they have seem to uh, be inconsistent with the position and posture of the President of the United States and basically assisting uh, quite dramatically uh, Mr. Gorbachev in his negotiations with the President. Senator McGovern? Well, I agree that the uh, Congress of the United States should not be directly involved in trying mm. to set the terms under which uh, negotiations go forward. Uh, I understand some of the frustration in the House of Representatives that I think produced this action. I was sympathetic to it, but um, I think it is difficult for our system to work when you have too many people trying to carry on the negotiating um, responsibility. By the same token, I wish presidents, not only this president, but some others that we have had, would be more careful about respecting the Constitution right to decide whether this country goes to war or not. As I read the Constitution of the United States, the Founding Fathers very clearly put the war-making power in the hands of Congress. Congress shall have the right to declare war, not the president. And I think what we're witnessing here is an outbreak of anger and resentment and frustration on the uh, part of the Congress that uh, one arm of the administration seems to be dragging us into a military involvement uh, in Nicaragua and in Central America, and we've slid into other wars that way by uh, executive action. Uh, I also think there's a lot of frustration over the fact that the uh, President of the United States has passed up this opportunity for a complete ban on the testing of nuclear weapons. Uh, that was originally an American idea. Now Mr. Gorbachev has unilaterally put in effect a moratorium in the Soviet Union since August of 1985 under which no nuclear weapons have been tested, either in the air, underground, or in the water, or anywhere else. And I think a great many members of the Congress, and I share this frustration, think we're missing a great opportunity to slow down this arms race by a mutual agreement not to go forward with the testing of nuclear weapons. Again, I think the reason we don't agree on that is that the president wants to move ahead with the Strategic Defense Initiative. I, I think it's important to keep in mind, if I, if I can, do I have a minute? Yes, a minute, and then we've got to go to the phones. <laughs> no, we've got to go to the phones. Okay, uh, it, is the fact that uh, uh, the Soviet Union is very quick uh, to, to talk about frameworks of agreements, and they want us to agree with those frameworks, and then they talk about verification, which obviously is very important. I think the Senator and I would agree. And the Soviet record with regard to compliance of those agreements has not been good. Uh, and, and therefore, I think it's important to keep that in mind as you're negotiating these agreements with the Soviet Union. We have a call standing by from your, your home state, Congressman. Deal, New Jersey. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. I'd just like to applaud uh, C-SPAN for having a program 
uh, right as uh, some significant event like the uh, collapse of the summit has occurred. I think it's also very important uh, that you have the basic, typical Democrat uh, apologist, George McGovern, on, uh, who probably typifies more than anybody else uh, the <coughs> reactionist uh, to just common sense uh, that's, uh, that's occurring in this country, and which I think the Democrats uh, typically stand for. More people have died to allow him to uh, be able to get up on a program like this and state his views over the last number of wars uh, than uh, I would care to, to really talk about. Uh, I think the important thing uh, is that the Soviets have a two-pronged strategy. I think part of their strategy uh, is to get uh, and orchestrate, uh, and I don't think it was an accident that you had a lot of demonstrations in Europe. Uh, that it's, I don't think it's an accident that many Democrats come out uh, once they see and read the fine print and find reason to criticize the president. But they're trying to distract us by pointing us in the direction of uh, nuclear <coughs> uh, uh, settlements when in reality, over the last 25 years, we've had Vietnam, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, countries that were free 25 years ago uh, have fallen by the wayside into communism uh, while we've been concerned over uh, the nuclear uh, debacle. The reality is, is that their strategy has worked perfectly uh, because they've allowed us to be concerned with the, the nuclear war uh, when in reality the most important complex in, in the Soviet Union is the military uh, economic complex. They've been waging conventional war, they've been waging economic war, and they've been allowing us to concentrate uh, on the nuclear aspect of it uh, when in reality uh, uh, we really don't know what we're talking about. All right, let me stop you right there and we'll get a response. Senator, do you want to start out? Well, let me say this first of all to this uh, gentleman who talks about all the people who have died so that I can have free speech in the United States. Uh, I've been one of those Americans who was willing to lay it on the line, too, in order to defend freedom in this country. I don't know whether the gentleman knows it or not, but I was a bomber pilot in the Second World War, a volunteer. I'm very proud of it. I flew uh, 35 combat missions and laid my life on the line when it counted. Uh, to stop the greatest threat to freedom in my lifetime, which was uh, Hitler and his uh, monstrous uh, forces. And I would do it again under similar circumstances. So I don't want this fellow uh, lecturing me on patriotism and the right of free speech. I understand the sacrifices that have to be uh, made for freedom. But I totally disagree with his analysis that the uh, Soviet Union has been so successful I think, they're, I think they're declining as an influential power uh, in the world. They've completely lost out with their major ally of 25 years ago, the uh, People's Republic of China. They've got a billion Chinese uh, looking at them very suspiciously, if not in a hostile way at the present time. They haven't, they've lost their ally uh, in Egypt, uh, where they were once uh, a presence. They're losing ground in, uh, in Africa. Uh, I don't think they have nearly the influence in Europe that they once had. They don't, they don't even occupy a very sure position in their satellites. Countries like uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and other countries uh, along their own border. So I disagree that the Soviets have been so much more brilliant uh, than we have and so much wiser in the strategy that they pursued. I think the United States uh, has more respect uh, in the world today and has a system that's admired by more people uh, than the system inside the Soviet Union. But what I'm pleading for here tonight is not an endorsement of the Soviet Union or its system, where a system that I wouldn't want to live under, but I am imploring, uh, I'm pleading for a recognition here that we do all live on this same planet, whether we're Russians uh, or whether we're Americans, and that if we continue on this present course, of more and more nuclear weapons on both sides, two things are going to happen. The economic pressures are going to continue, the deficits are going to grow larger, and sooner or later we reach the point where if war should come, there's no real hope for survival. May I uh, just add something to that? <clears throat> Number one, I, I hear all the time this, this constant uh, spiral of more and more nuclear weapons. 
I think it's important to keep in mind that the United States, in fact, has fewer nuclear weapons now than it did 20 years ago. And as far as uh, the explosive power of those nuclear weapons, we have about one-third or one-quarter of what we had 20 years ago. That's a far cry from more and more. Uh, granted, our weapons are more accurate than they were, but they're not greater in number, nor, they are, nor are they greater in explosive power. Uh, the Soviet Union's weapons are greater in number and greater in explosive power, indeed more than ours and more than theirs were 20 years ago. Uh, secondly, I'd like to point out about the fact that I have heard uh, forever, ever since I was old enough to read, that the Soviet Empire was about to crumble internally, that they were not popular, uh, that it was not a very attractive form of government. It was not a system to be admired. Uh, the economy was faltering. The high incidence of alcoholism. Uh, their, their, their roads have potholes and, and, and their apartments are falling down. Now, the point here is the fact that, sure, we have uh, greater wealth than they. That's because of our system permits individual liberty and freedom, and theirs does not. Theirs is a closed, a totalitarian police state. The point here is that the Soviet Union is indeed a shockingly more militarily powerful uh, than they were 20 years ago. Uh, they have increased offensive capabilities, and now, of course, to go with those offensive nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities, uh, they are doing as, as moving as fast as they can into the deployment of uh, defensive weapons. Uh, they have approximately uh, 20,000 scientists uh, working uh, in the uh, military uses of lasers. Uh, they have, uh, according to the best information that I receive, uh, violated the ABM treaty in the construction of what we call the Krasnoyarsk radar, uh, which is uh, a radar which is an important component of a nationwide strategic defensive system. Uh, they are upgrading their ABM system around Moscow. Uh, they have mobile radars, mobile surface-to-air missiles. Uh, so they, as much as uh, they economically are not something to write home about, militarily they surely are. It seems to me that that's a perfect case, what the congressman has just said, uh, for us moving ahead on some kind of reasonable arms control agreement. If, in fact, the Soviets are increasing their offensive capability all the time, if, in fact, they're increasing their defensive capability all the time, that makes the very point that I was trying to make here earlier uh, in the program, that it's all the more reason why we take advantage of the fact that they're willing and have been for the last uh, 15 months not to test uh, new nuclear weapons, that they're willing to, to uh, at least they tell us they're willing to enter yes, into an agreement. Problem. Well, just yeah. a minute, Carl. Okay. They're, they're, what they laid on the table was a proposal that each mm -hmm. side reduce substantially their strategic nuclear weapon systems as well as their intermediate range weapon systems, provided we would agree to restrain our efforts on SDI uh, to research purposes. I don't see anything wrong with that as a working proposal. I don't see but, why that uh, was rejected. Senator, now, you say they haven't kept their agreements in the past. It's not. On the basic outline of those agreements, I think they've been in compliance. They, how, uh, they, how about, they, how about the, the, the scrambling of information on their tests so we couldn't monitor well, them carefully? Well, there, there have been complaints uh, President on... President Carter was very concerned there, about that. There, We're talking about the encryption that there, takes there, place. There are complaints is that, on, is that not a violation? Is that in there are compliance with all both sides about this. I know as there's well, complaints, as well, as but well they're as doing they, it and we're not. As well as the system that they have uh, is that, uh, under, is, underway mm -hmm. up there in, in Siberia. Is that a compliance, well, though? That's no reason to throw the baby out with well, the well, bat. It, it's the a reason is, to, you it's say a reason to negotiate the Senator, points you, on which we disagree. Senator, you said that they were in substantial compliance, and my question is, is that compliance? Yes, the I encryption think is, is compliance. There's I no problem no, with that. You're not worried about it. No, that's an area of possible non-compliance. What I'm saying to you is that on the basic weapon ceilings that they are agreed to, which is the guts of the agreement, putting a cap on the various weapon systems, I think <clears throat> they've stayed in compliance. I think that there's no evidence that they violated the 23-year-old agreement against the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. I haven't seen any evidence that they violated their mm -hmm. own commitment not to test weapons of any kind during this moratorium. I think they've stayed mm -hmm. within the basic you, ceilings that they agreed to both uh -huh. on SALT 1 and SALT 2. Now, maybe we negotiated those ceilings too high, but, but the fact is, I think they've stayed within well, the ceilings. Well, well, we need you, to go to a call. Okay. Senator, we'll give you the last word on this point, then we'll start with you, <laughs> Congressman. <laughs> Seattle, Washington, go ahead, please. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. McGovern, the Things, the views that you expressed at the first of this program, 
underline exactly why this nation voted in a landslide for President Reagan. And mixed in with it, I must add, sounds like a little bit of sour grace. Uh, national strategic defense is important. It's the first time in years, years and years, decades, in fact, that the Russians have truly wanted to talk with us. And while all of the citizens cannot be told everything that is going on, as the Senator most certainly knows, um, whatever is there will guard our, our nation and our country. Again, CNN, thank goodness, has adopted some of C-SPAN, and I could hear, all of us could, English was spoken at Reykjavik. I heard what everyone had to say. And I really don't need a news analysis. The United States, in the form of President Reagan, offered all the slashes in everything. The United States offered all of it. Turn back to the CNN tapes if you happen to have them. It's sitting right there. And the Russians, again, came in with one thing only. They were willing to meet it, but only for strategic defense. And this is national defense. Unfortunately, we also assumed what the British called the balance of power, and now we have to guard the world, which I don't know that it <laughs> gets to be a large problem. But good heavens, this is the first time we've made any headway. And I certainly hope that whoever, if the president could stay in, I'd want him another four years. All right, Seattle, thank you. Senator, we'll start with you since it was addressed to you. Well, uh, let me say, first of all, I don't know why the uh, American people voted as they did. The lady may be right that they like Reagan's defense posture. That doesn't mean it's right. Uh, voters have changed their minds in the past. Voters are not always right, any more than politicians are always right. All any of us can do, whether we're voters uh, or politicians, is say what we think. And that's what I'm trying to do here tonight. I'm not running for election, and I'm not running for any uh, popularity contest. I'm not in office, and I'm not running for any office. I'm trying to say what I think on public questions. And what I believe is that the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative or Star Wars, or whatever you want to choose to call it, gives the illusion of defense with no, with no defense. It's enormously expensive. I think the total cost is somewhere around a trillion dollars. But there's no uh, evidence that I've seen so far that indicates to me it'll protect us against anything. I think what will happen as we proceed to deploy this, and Congressman, I'm not sure we can deploy it in any faster than five or six years, or maybe 10, mm -hmm. but if we proceed to deploy it and move ahead on it, I have no doubt at all that the uh, Soviet military planners will do what they can to build offensive systems designed to neutralize it mm -hmm. and overwhelm us. So we end up with the illusion that we're building a safe uh, shield over the country when what we're actually inviting is simply uh, a larger uh, arms race. Uh, yeah, two quick comments. First of all, on the comprehensive test ban, because it's been brought up a couple of times. Uh, first of all, I'm one of those that holds that uh, you should test uh, your weapon systems to make sure they work. Um, I'm the congressman that initiated the uh, Office of Operational Testing to make sure that our weapons uh, were effectively tested uh, uh, objectively to make sure they were not success-oriented, those tests. If we rely on something, we have to make sure it works. If that is true with regard to those systems, such as armored personnel carriers, upon which uh, our national security does not depend, uh, with greater reason, I think the testing is important with respect to those weapons upon which our ultimate national security does depend. And let me, let me finish. Um, you, you indicated uh, that uh, Star Wars, as uh, you continue to call it, and of course, I'll a lot, lot, lot of people. Oh, okay, it'll make you, you happier. Guys. Well, it'll make me happier when you share my views. <laughs> not that I don't care what you call it. Um, that uh, it'll cost a uh, trillion dollars. That may be your estimate. That's certainly not the estimate of uh, many of the people that I've spoken to. Um, your, your view that it uh, is not going to work is not shared by uh, Edward Teller, um, who very recently sent a letter to the President of the United States urging him to make the decision to deploy uh, those short-term systems that can work. And everybody knows that he's a very famous, probably our most famous living physicist in the United States. Also the most uh, Physicist wrong Bob, Bob Jastrow, Lowell Wood, uh, Jay Keyworth, and of recently uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. 
uh, who was, uh, I believe it was President Carter's national security advisor, in the strongest terms uh, is urging the President of the United States to make the decision to deploy non-nuclear defensive systems. In addition, Henry Kissinger. These people aren't scientists, but they're highly respected strategic thinkers. They all believe, as I do, uh, that the President is, is right with regard to SDI and that we should move toward it. Well, I think the congressman wouldn't dispute the fact that at least 90 out of 100 of all uh, recognized nuclear scientists think that this strategic defense initiative is a completely impractical I, I and, yeah. and unwise uh, proposal. I really don't know anybody of a recognizable name in the scientific field other than Teller and possibly these other gentlemen you mentioned that well, are so well known, recognizable. Uh, are, are for it. But the great body of scientific opinion is that there is no defense. Uh, in the event of a nuclear attack. So far as I know, even the advocates of the strategic defense initiative don't argue that it'll defend us against missiles launched from submarines or from yeah, yes, bombers or from think, cruise missiles that, that they're... That is, well, let me, let me, finish, let me okay. finish the point. Okay. But my understanding is that even the architects of the program uh, have said that it's designed to defend us against land-based missiles, but not against these other missiles. So you're still going to have to preserve uh, your deterrent uh, capability. And it would take a very naive individual to argue that you can build an airtight shield against tens of thousands of incoming uh, nuclear missiles. The kind of computer system that you'd have to set up uh, to intercept these missiles in the first one, two, or three minutes, which is what I understand the system requires, boggles the mind. You can't even depend on a simple computer to get the bills out right, let alone, yeah. uh, let alone to tell us when we ought to start a nuclear war. Congressman, uh, uh, your last word, then we go to a phone. Okay, uh, I guess my point is that, uh, Senator, do you think that people, uh, some of which I've mentioned, uh, uh, Robert Jastro, Edward Teller, Zbig Brzezinski, mm -hmm. uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, would make statements uh, that were not true. They really believe that no, SDI. I, I, I'm not uh, imputing is, is their sincerity. No, no, not, not my sincerity. No, not their sincerity either. Theirs. I'm not imputing their sincerity, um, just their judgment. Well, You know, the point here is that uh, the Soviet Union, uh, the, the Americans, if we go along with, uh, with uh, uh, the senator's position, uh, the United States very regrettably is going to be uh, finding the day when the Soviet Union not only has massive offensive weapons, but a robust strategic defense capability that's, as well. I think that's, I think that's what we're going to have. And if that's the case, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would hope that you would want the United States having the ability to defend ourselves. If we can spend $300 billion per year is what we spend generally with regard to our offensive capabilities, whether it be the foot soldier, whether it be tanks, whether it be rockets, whether it be mortars, whether it be uh, submarines, strategic submarines, strategic weapons. If we can spend $300 billion on offensive weapons, why can't we spend some billion dollars on defensive weapons? Well, as you know, Congressman, they call the whole thing defense. Uh, mm. the, the defense but it's department. not. It's offensive weapons. I think we ought to move toward the deployment of defensive systems and not I, spend all our money on weapons that are designed for the destruction I, of I'm human sure beings. I'm sure I'm not going to convince some, the Congress. No, you're not. And some we'll weapons to designed this. to preserve but human beings. I just beings. complete this point again. I, just, I don't want viewers to think that I'm arguing against defense. If mm -hmm. I thought for one minute uh, building this system would make us one iota more secure than we are today, I'd be for it. It'll do just the opposite. I'm going to predict, and I hope, I hope, I hope that this never comes to pass, that if we go ahead with this strategic defense initiative, regardless of what it costs, whether it's billions or trillions or whatever, that the inevitable result is that the Soviets are going to counter both with a greater effort on their side on defensive weapons and also offensive uh, weapons. And five, ten years down the road, we're going to say, my goodness, this hasn't deterred them at all. We've got a bigger arms race. We're in greater danger. We're going to now have to do such and such in order to close the gaps that have been opened by this new escalation. That's why I'm opposed to this st strategic defense initiative. I did promise it was your last word, but we'll do it the next time. Okay. Burbank, Illinois, good evening. Good evening, Kerry Collins. Your program is the most important thing that's ever happened to this country. Thank you. Congressman Carter, please stop interrupting. You sound like Pat Buchanan or Robert <laughs> Novak. God forbid. <laughs> Senator McGovern, Senator, you have been and still are 
correct in your approach to arms race politics, and uh, please don't apologize. Uh, the good guys haven't yet lost. Um, I would like to talk about disinformation, not uh, disinformation on Libya or Cuba or Nicaragua, but disinformation on the vulnerability, the window of vulnerability, the Astrodome dome con concept of the Star Wars, and if you have time, on the missile experimental. All right, sir, well, I think the, there is a disinformation campaign that's been going on on this window of vulnerability business. That was the argument that the president used from the beginning to justify a trillion dollar increase in military spending over the last five and a half years, which we've now, now completed. He said we had to do this in, in effect because our land-based missile system had become vulnerable. And he hid from the American people the fact that most of our missiles are not on the land. We put 50% of them on submarines. We put another 20% in bombers. We have the cruise missile. So that only about 25% of our offensive and deterrent uh, nuclear missile system, which in a sense turns out to be a defensive system if you use it for deterrence, only about 25% of that is on the land. In the Soviet Union, it's just the reverse. So what the president ought to be saying is that how wise we were that our defense planners saw fit uh, to give us a system in which most of our missiles are not on the land uh, where he says they would be uh, vulnerable. Now, as to this uh, Astrodome effect on Star Wars, I think the caller is absolutely right. The notion that somehow you can build a shield over this country that's going to repel incoming missiles is sheer nonsense. No one even pretends that knows anything about the concept of SDI that it will do that. It is supposed to have the capability five or ten years down the road to intercept some of the land-based Soviet missiles provided. That attack can be detected in the first one or two missiles, in the first one or two minutes, and the uh, laser system put in action by uh, computers and those missiles intercepted shortly after the launch stage. I don't see how anyone could argue that we could build a hundred percent Astrodome over the United States mm -hmm. to deter even the land-based missile. But even if you did that, you'd still have to face the submarine-launched missiles, you'd still have to face the bombers, the cruise missiles, the ships, uh, carrying nuclear missiles, and any of those forces mm -hmm. are strong enough to destroy much of the United States. Um, two things. First of all, uh, a comment about a trillion dollar increase in defense spending. I note with interest that uh, the defense spending that the Congress did authorize, and I assume that's what you're referring no, to. With total, regard, a total oh, I understand that, that we have authorized over the past yeah. number of years mm -hmm. is very uh, in line, very frankly, with what the proposal was by Jimmy Carter when he was president in his five-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really not that shocking when you, when you look at it and examine it in comparison to what uh, the Carter administration wanted for the next five years. They realized at that particular time that the Soviets uh, were relentless and all their military capabilities, and our own capabilities need, needed modernization. Um, let me just a couple of words with regard to a couple of statements, and we just flatly disagree, and scientists are going to have to get back on the program mm -hmm. later. Um, I disagree. Um, if you can stop ICBMs, you can stop airplanes. Uh, if you can stop ICBMs, according to the scientists that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to dozens and dozens of them, you can stop uh, the threat from a, uh, from a submarine. Uh, airplanes obviously go torturously uh, slow uh, compared to intercontinental ballistic missiles, and sea launch ballistic missiles compared to ICBMs go mm -hmm. slower as well, and they're easier targets, <coughs> the same as cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I mean, if, if what we were saying is you could stop an intercontinental ballistic missile and there was no defenses against an air threat, well, then I'd agree with you. But I would say it's just simply wrong, and obviously we disagree. Finally, it's my belief uh, that uh, even without a perfect defense, you can deter completely the use of offensive weapons. Uh, if you have a three-layer defensive system, each layer only 70% effective, you would increase from the one or two missiles now that the Soviets would need to target an American target to have a 95% assurance that it would knock it out to 300. They don't have the capability, they would not have, the, have that capability, and therefore the negotiations for the reduction of these weapons uh, would, would be possible. 
and uh, Congressman, if, the, so if the Soviets are as evil and determined as you say they are, and they well, may very well be, I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that they're Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think, if we proceed with this defensive system, that they won't? provide the extra strategic missiles that you say would be necessary to overwhelm it because, or to keep because, them in their present. Because, because, why wouldn't they make that oh, investment? All right, they would not make that investment because they could not. Uh, the point is, I just mentioned some numbers to you. Uh, what you're arguing is why wouldn't they increase their warheads uh, by, by a factor of 300? Uh, when they have one warhead striking a target, why don't they increase that to 300? It would probably take them 300 years to do that. The point is uh, that properly deployed defensive systems using multi-layers um, that use directed energy as well as kinetic energy um, are much cheaper uh, than the further construction of uh, land-based ICBMs and submarines. And that is the reason they're simply not going to do it. The problem with these nuclear weapons is that they're not like the kind of bombs I was dropping in mm -hmm. World War II. No. In World War II, if we lost 10% uh, of our bombers on a mission, we thought it was a catastrophe. Yeah. Now, an attacking country uh, can lose 99 of the incoming missiles aimed at Washington mm -hmm. or New York or Seattle, but if the 100 ones get through, that city disappears. There's nobody alive. And uh, I hope you're not going to tell viewers here tonight that you think it's possible to devise a defensive shield over this country that if war comes, is going to make us safe from nuclear attack. There's no place to it, hide. It's not, you're, not, you're not going to be hermetically sealed, but you would certainly stop uh, the advantage or stop the or create an incentive not to use the weapons because a military planner in the Soviet Union would not know where they would land. It would be impossible to make that determination. Congressman, if there's a nuclear war, mm -hmm. Let me put it to you this way. We're trying it, to stop it, it, it here, even, I even, uh, even if we had uh, a device some kind, this miraculous device you and the President are talking about, uh, that could prevent these weapons from exploding over the United States, if either side, either the Soviet Union or the United States, just exploded the nuclear weapons they have in an attempted attack on the other side, and the other side did nothing, you'd still have enough nuclear radioactive poison floating around mm -hmm. in the atmosphere for the next six months to kill yeah. everybody well, that's around. Well, that's why you'd we want to deploy... We're not going to be hiding that, under a tent. Fine. That's why you would want to deter, to stop the Soviets from thinking that there can be a military advantage by using those weapons. You want to have weapons that would render them useless. I can't now, these imagine. When, these, these weapons would be used, or these anti-weapons would be used, and therefore the, the nuclear warhead would not go off. It seems to me you would want that. Finally, let, let me just point this. Your argument is, and I think it breaks down on this point, that you are saying, that you're basically saying, that we have reached the time in humanity that there is no defenses against this type of a system. That's correct. We have heard that throughout history. Yeah. And there was people uh, that said there was no, true. that's right, there's, there's been no defense against a bow and arrow, mm -hmm. then there was no defense against a longbow, mm -hmm. there's no, no, no defense against uh, a cannon, mm -hmm. and no defense against an airplane, and now you're saying there's no, it, every time in history you've proved been wrong. That's Technology finally, does <coughs> increase. We have finally reached that stage in the history of mankind that a, basically when you, when you, when you compare uh, the speed and the accuracy of an intercontinental ballistic missile, it is slow, lumbering, and inaccurate compared to director, directed energy weapons. You're saying we have yeah. finally reached the time where an offensive threat can never be defended against, and I disagree. Chairman, well, I would rather rely on American technology than Soviet diplomacy. At that point, let me go to this call. Palm Springs, California, good evening. Uh, good evening, um, gentlemen. Uh, it's nice listening to your conversation here. I'd like to uh, just throw out a couple of thoughts here, but i will let you know from the start that I'm really not taking sides with either one of you. Uh, I think my views are a little different. I, I personally think that uh, the myth of the Russian threat is exactly what, a, what it is. It's just a myth. I think it's overstated. Uh, for the last 40 years, we've been hearing about this. And I simply do not believe it, Be simply for this reason. Since World War II, the world has become international. It's no, no, no longer national. It's, it's uh, archaic to think that two nations can carry out a, a nuclear war or international war on their own without affecting everybody. <clears throat> now, the interest that the United States has and the Soviets have in third world countries 
far surpasses what they would do to themselves. Fighting each other will simply destroy all of their interests in the third world. They have other uh, more important threats to themselves than each other. They've got the Iranian problem. They have the Afghanistan problem. They have the Nicaraguan problem. They got the Polish problem. The Russians can't even support their own satellite countries without the help from the West. They're just about to crumble. There's no, there's no threat at all there. I think the real threat is the fact that uh, these two superpowers are being financed by the world system to fight the third world. We're fighting a third world war now against the third world. Okay, sir, let's, let's see what our uh, guests think. Well, I, I'm not sure. I think we covered that earlier in the evening. <coughs> I would argue that the Soviet Union, with all their bristling missiles, uh, with, the, with their closed society, uh, with their totalitarian regime, with their systematic denial of human rights even among their own citizens, uh, with, their, with their denial of simple justice to their own people, uh, with their invasion of Afghanistan, uh, with uh, their proxy, the Soviet Union, having, Cu having uh, a Cuba, that is, having troops uh, uh, in Angola, in Ethiopia, <coughs> and now in Nicaragua, uh, with their basically denying uh, uh, free trade unions in all of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, with their encroachment in various countries in, in, South a in uh, Southern Africa and, and the continent of Af Africa does pose a threat. Uh, what we're talking about here is deterring the Soviet Union. And, and I'd like to raise an additional, I think is a very interesting thought. Um, if uh, the Soviet Union, uh, according to your philosophy and your analysis, and indeed to a certain, and although lesser extent, to the senators, is not a threat, uh, that they're not a danger, in the sense that uh, they are not powerful as much as they used to be, their economy is a wreck, their leadership is, uh, is, is, is not in, are not in control, they have a difficulty in, in the keeping track of their satellite countries now versus 10 or 15 years ago. They obviously, nevertheless, if that is true, uh, they want to be a world power. And without being a world power, they would be a uh, uh, second or third rate power. If you compare their economy, they would be less influential than Japan. They would probably be less influential than Hong Kong. Uh, they don't want that. Obviously, they don't want that. The only thing that makes the Soviet Union a respected, a feared world power is their military capabilities. And the one thing in those military capabilities that gives them the ability to have so much in <coughs> uh, to have 10,000 press uh, fly up to every statement when there's a summit, uh, is their nuclear arsenal. It seems to me it defies logic for me to believe without a clear incentive to do so by the United States deploying defensive systems which makes less effective Soviet offensive weapons. Without that, it defies me why the Soviet Union would voluntarily place themselves into being a second or third rate power. Senator. Well, uh, let me say I agree with much of what the uh, gentleman has just said. Uh, it may be overstating it a little to say that the Soviet Union is no threat but it certainly is a myth to talk about the supremacy of Soviet military power. I don't know any responsible uh, commander that would trade the American Air Force for the Soviet Air Force, or that would trade our Navy for theirs, or our overall nuclear uh, position. Certainly I would not. I think we have a clearly uh, superior uh, strength in all of those uh, areas. Uh, and it is a myth, in my opinion, to talk about their a superiority. Uh, if they were all that strong uh, militarily, it's hard to explain why they have their hands full in Afghanistan, an impoverished little uh, sparsely settled country on their border where they seem to be running into the same kind of troubles that we encountered in uh, Vietnam. And I think that's what the caller is referring to, that these uh, superpowers may be a threat to each other if they begin throwing around uh, nuclear weapons. But there are very important challenges in this world that we need to be turning our attention to that are not going to be resolved with Star Wars or any other kind of uh, weapons system. I personally would like to see us get on with the business of a nuclear test ban to halt all testing of nuclear weapons of all kinds. And then I'd like to see us abandon this nonsense over Star Wars, over the Strategic Defense Initiative, and take advantage of the opportunity we have to negotiate substantial reductions in these offensive uh, nuclear systems uh, on both sides. If we would do that and begin to turn this arms race around, then we'd have the resources in both countries to begin doing some cooperative things on pollution, 
on uh, economic development in the third world, on the population problems, and some of the other things that in the long term may be a greater threat to our security. Franklin, Wisconsin is next. Good evening. Good evening. Go ahead, sir. Uh, for the senator from New Jersey, if he thinks that this Star Wars thing will work without dropping anything on the states, I mean, he's pretty naive. Now, and I'd like him to look into the governor's eyes, and he's a warrior. Like all those liberal Democrats get on there, and they think that we've never seen war. I myself have spent 20 years on submarines, and every time we get on these programs, like somebody like McGovern, that uses a little common sense, that we don't know what we're talking about. We've been there. We've seen it. That's right. my comment. All right. Thank you, Franklin. Anything to add? Nothing to add. It was a comment, really. Mm -hmm. uh, people who have been in action obviously take uh, differing views on weapon systems. So, uh, therefore, since one saw co combat, doesn't mean that they have a corner to uh, the, the right position. Mm -hmm. I have no other comment than that. Let me um, ask a, a political party type of sure. question. If President Reagan is seen as a winner in this vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Gorbachev, will the Republicans in mm -hmm. November benefit? I, I don't know whether it's impossible at this particular juncture to, uh, to know whether he'd be perceived as a winner or not. Uh, I would imagine and I would hope that the American people recognize what is going on here and that's the fact that this president is not and was not willing to be pushed around. Uh, he was told in no uncertain terms that he had to take a 10-year non-deployment or continuation of an anti-ballistic missile treaty all the while the Soviet Union is violating same and he said no. Uh, I think the American people are going to respect that. I, I hope it very frankly has no influence over the elections. That's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I was hoping that there'd be no meeting between the two leaders before the elections because they may have one eye on the election while they're having one eye on, on, on the negotiations, which is not healthy. Uh, but I think we'll just simply have to wait and find, to find out what uh, type of impact this may have. On, I'm sure you're referring to the Senate elections. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. one of the questions. Do you see a, a possible impact, Senator? I really have no idea. <clears throat> I, uh, I don't know what the politics of this issue is. It's so much more fundamental. Uh, than the immediate political reaction that uh, I hate to talk about it in those terms. We're really talking about the uh, survival uh, of this country and of other peoples uh, around the world. I would like to define what I think is the issue that people are going to have to consider. The, the issue, it seems to me, uh, is whether they want to move ahead on this uh, Star Wars system or whether they want an arms control agreement. You cannot have both. Now, you can argue that the uh, Soviets may be wrong in holding out on that basis, but those are the terms. Uh, the one thing that gives me some consolation for the future is the fact that I believe that whoever is elected president in 1988, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, I think uh, the SDI system will probably collapse politically. I think it takes someone that's as good an actor on television as uh, Ronald Reagan to do the kind of a snow job that it's tilt. going to take uh, <laughs> to sell this uh, STI thing. It's, uh, that's, that's a, uh, it's such a phony that it takes a real television master to put Are it Are you across. saying, Senator, let me ask you this question. I really, uh, if the president was here, I'm sure he'd take umbrage at that statement, very frankly, and I'm not here to defend him. Uh, but You're doing poll after job. poll, poll after, thank you very much, poll <laughs> after poll, at least let me just say, my congressional district in the state of New Jersey, um, Poll after poll that I've taken in my congressional district shows that the American people, by a majority of 80 percent, want the United States to deploy a system that defends against Soviet nuclear attack, a strategic defense system. Are you saying that they're actors? Are you, are you saying that 80 percent of the people in my congressional district have been duped by President Ronald Reagan? Is this Reagan? just your district? Uh, uh, th those are all the national polls I see. It's a very popular thing. There's about 30 or 40 percent of America that believes we're now defended, that believes that the Department of Defense is trying to do its job in defending our country, which mm -hmm. it's not. It's building yeah. offensive weapons, as you know. And about 75 or 80 percent of the people in this nation, nationwide, believes that the United States should deploy what, defensive systems. What and do you I, think I, about 
I those, can't. Uh, uh, what did you think about those national polls, Congressman, <laughs> when they were showing here a while back that 75 or 80 percent of the American people wanted a nuclear freeze that would stop the development of all new nuclear weapons, well, including Well, why SDI. do you believe that I mean, poll if you're going to and cite deny, poll. exactly, well, I, the only reason I cited that was because you said that only a few people must be duped by a very clever Ronald Reagan who's no, acting. I didn't say a few I people, would say that Ronald Reagan deeply believes in peace. He deeply believes in uh, the concept of moving toward defensive systems and away from offensive systems. He deeply believes that the job and the function and the responsibility of the Department of Defense in the United States should be to preserve human life rather than threatening it. And well, you say he's acting, and I think that trivializes well, the I'm entire Well, I'm not sure debate. it's uh, acting or just good you use. You said it of, was. Uh, I said it was good use of acting ability on, uh, on television. I think he's a master the television screen. I watched him today make a very thin case uh, look reasonably attractive and I don't want to un underestimate the capacity of this man to sell his ideas. I, neither do I but attack you, Reagan's sincerity. Reagan doesn't have to sell the idea. The American people are sold on well, who, the idea sold of them? protecting themselves. Who sold it to them? Who sold them that the was SDI long concept? Be, long it's Reagan's before. concept and he's the chief salesman. No, he, he is obviously the chief spokesman of the position right now because he's the president of the United States. Uh, but there were books written about strategic defense long before the president's speech of March 1983. You probably uh, uh, read some of them. I know I did. The concept predates uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency. The concept uh, predates uh, World War II. Winston Churchill talked about defending uh, Great Britain against the bomber threat. There was people in his country that said there's no defense against the bomber threat. Let Radars won't work. Let's not build radars. The bomb won't go off. Let's not build a hydrogen bomb. The Soviets are not doing it. Andrei Sakharov in the Soviet Union was charged with the responsibility of building a bomb Congress, before we I, made let, our decision. Let me just say with you, I have, uh, I have great topic. faith in what American science can accomplish and what uh, but they scientists, can accomplish but let this. me this, what scientists can accomplish around the world and I think they've finally done it. They've finally achieved the ultimate weapon against which there's no defense. I, I believe with all of my heart, talking about sincerity, there is no defense. Now if that you have two great, off, wait a minute, wait a, a minute. When you have two great countries that are sitting here with approximately 10,000 strategic no nuclear warheads on both sides and just two of those nuclear weapons, infinitely less powerful, brought Japan to its knees 40 years ago. There's no defense if those weapons are used except the deterrence against their use. We long ago on both sides, both in the Soviet Union and the United States, we passed the point where we had enough weapons to deter the other side from using them. Why don't we call a halt to this and recognize right now if we don't build an additional weapon, each side can utterly pulverize the, the, the other if war comes. The senator. I have to take a call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll get back to it, I promise. Okay. Honolulu, Hawaii, good evening. Hello. Uh, Hello. It's interesting to see that uh, the Democrat Party is going to take Gorbachev's position. And I'm not talking about loyalty now, so don't don't give me all that blather about I'm calling... Well, we're getting a lot of blather from you, sir. You know, I agree with the British sometimes, or the French, or the Israelis, but that doesn't make me a disloyal American. That might make me mistaken in judgment. But, not, you know, so I don't want to hear the baloney about, oh, you're impugning my loyalty. I'm not. Sir. Okay. But... I thought that Reagan uh, had offered to delay the st strategic defense uh, deployment for a 10-year period if, the, if we could negotiate real reductions in long-range strategic missiles. Schultz had hinted at that two, two days ago when he was at a news conference and said, um, <coughs> if we have deep cuts in offensive missile strength, the reason for deploying the strategic defense right away would be somewhat lessened. I think that's a, a decent position on which to negotiate. By the way, I'm wondering, I was wondering why the, uh, why the media and the Democrat Party refuse to recognize that the Soviets have been working on their own strategic defense for years. And I was wondering why the media says, oh, Reagan wouldn't agree, couldn't agree to give up strategic defense 
for the offensive missile cut. So what we would they want him to what they want him to do is to give up strategic defense and give up our uh, ballistic missiles in return for the Soviet ballistic missiles. That would leave the Soviets with their strategic defense and their missiles. Okay, sir, thank you. Well, it's understandable why the uh, caller might be confused on what happened in uh, Iceland because all of us are limited in the knowledge we have out of that conference so far, but he has the matter just reversed when he said that Reagan proposed that he would delay for 10 years doing anything on the strategic defense initiative in return for an agreement on the part of the mm. Soviet Union to make substantial cuts in strategic systems. That was their proposal. Uh, the gentleman says he approves that. He thinks it's reasonable. I do too. The fact that it came from Gorbachev doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, if Gorbachev comes out against smallpox, that doesn't mean we have to be for smallpox. But he has the matter just upside down. He's confusing the Gorbachev proposal uh, with the uh, Reagan proposal. Congressman? Well, I, I believe uh, President Reagan made the proposal to the delay uh, the testing and deployment of SDI for seven and a half years. That didn't uh, that come was out not, today, I, I mean, he, he made, the, you, you know as well as I do, that that was the proposal that the president made. I thought it was the wrong one because mm -hmm. I don't think we should delay it at all. But that simply uh, was a proposal did, did that, he he that, made, in Iceland? that he had made uh, before Iceland uh, by letter and the president, before going to uh, Reykjavik, said that, that was his position, that it would be a five-year uh, total halt to two years for negotiations. If the negotiations failed, another six months mm -hmm. um, of, uh, of warning that one side would therefore be able to deploy strategic defense. So that's seven and a half years, it's a long way. Uh, that was construed to be totally unacceptable to Mikhail Gorbachev. I think they, uh, they made a mistake. I think uh, because of the atmospherics that I mentioned before, because they felt there'd be a great deal of pressure on Ronald Reagan to return the favor, the favor being the release of uh, Nicholas Daniloff, that Ronald Reagan would accept this deal. But he recognized it was not in the interest of this country. I know mm -hmm. that you and I respectfully disagree mm -hmm. on that. Um, I don't uh, believe that uh, uh, there's, and I know that the senator is one of the most articulate spokesmen we can hear tonight on the position that there's somehow safety in perpetual vulnerability because that's precisely the situation we're in today, and I don't agree. Well, we, we're going to live with vulnerability as long as we're in the nuclear age. Each country is vulnerable to the other's Pro nuclear provide, arsenal. Provided and, and, whenever, they, and whenever we get to the illusion that we're safe in the nuclear age, that's when we're in the greatest danger. That's one of my problems with the Strategic Defense Initiative, is that it will create the illusion in the minds of some people, maybe even in the minds of the Soviets, that the Americans are now safe against <clears throat> nuclear attack. Well, if, and if, it's, if, that, if, it's that it's that kind of does illusion. that scare you that the Soviets it, uh, think that their offensive weapons think, wouldn't I think, work? I think would that, that be I a think, dangerous world? I think that's what would drive them, Congressman, to increase their offensive capability. Their their feeling that possibly the Americans are on to something that may neutralize some of their present. A nuclear deterrent. And if they were ever faced with even a suspicion that we could hit them, but they'd be unable to punish us in return, I have no doubt at all they'll go all out to increase their offensive capability to close that gap. Conversely, I think if the Soviets really believed uh, that their offensive weapons are, would be useless against the United States, the chances of their using them would be a lot less than if they thought that their offensive weapons would work. If you don't think a weapon is going to work, you don't use it. That's if fine. you think it has the military capabilities and then your goal is achievable, and then you have a greater chance That's of using it. That's why they're not going to sit still and watch us move ahead with a sophisticated defense system to find out whether it works. They're going to keep pace and doing everything they can to counter it. That, that just means a bigger and bigger arms race on both sides and less and less what? safety for each country. Let me try and squeeze one okay, more call here. Okay, we can do it. Like City, Oklahoma. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank C-SPAN for having on one of the great courageous men of our times, and Senator McGovern. And, uh, Senator, I have a question for you. I'd like to hear your uh, feelings about uh, the uh, possible connection between the president's insistence on holding on to this Star Wars thing and the military-industrial complex here in the United States. And is Star Wars... Uh, so much of a national security issue as it is possibly a uh, issue of uh, corporate greed 
with the millions and millions of dollars in defense contracts being let out on this whole mess. Okay, thanks for the call. So. Well, <clears throat> President Eisenhower said in that same uh, White House chair that President Reagan does, and he was there for eight years as a five-star uh, general of the armies. Uh, he concluded his eight years with a farewell address in which he said that a major danger to this country was the mounting political power of the military-industrial complex. He said you can feel it in every courthouse, every state house, in the halls of Congress, in the executive branch, and he warned against the political and lobbying power of that enormous uh, <clears throat> political uh, military industrial combine. I think it's quite possible that President Reagan, even without being fully aware of the source of this pressure, is responding in part from his own native California, from his industrial pals in Southern California where, where he's lived his life. I have no doubt that those pressures are brought to bear on every president on every member of the Congress. I felt them when I was a member of the Congress. The most powerful uh, political combine in this city of Washington is what President Eisenhower referred to as the military-industrial complex, and I think it's one of the reasons for Star Wars, SDI, and all these other fancy new weapon systems that add a lot to our budget and our tax costs, but add nothing to our security. Congressman, as we wind up, we'll give you the last word this uh, time. Th thank you very much. I certainly have enjoyed uh, the debate with Senator McGovern. Uh, with regard to the military-industrial complex and what they have done in the past 20 years, when uh, President uh, Eisenhower was President of the United States, we spent about 10 percent of our GNP on national security. That's down to about 6.5 to 7 percent today. When he was President of the United States, we spent approximately uh, 50 to 55 percent of all federal spending on national security uh, concerns, and that's down to about 33 percent today. Uh, finally, I might add, with regard to constituent pressure for SDI, I think most people will conclude, in fact, everybody I've spoken to, uh, that when it comes to constituent pressure, it's not on research and development. Uh, corporations don't make any money on R&D. They make it on building things. So if there's constituent pressure, it's on more airplanes, more offensive weapons, which is regrettable. Unfortunately, we have to wrap this up at some point. Thank you both very much for joining us. Senator George McGovern, having served in the Senate from South Dakota from 1963 to 1981, and also candidate for Democratic nomination in 84 and Democratic nominee in 1972. Congressman Jim Corder, a Republican from New Jersey, having uh, serving on the Armed Services Committee and also involved in observing the arms talks in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. If you'd like more information about this or any other C-SPAN program, please feel free to write to us. Our address is 400 North Capitol Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20001. 